Depending on the gear type there will be different forces and torques that create a reaction from the shaft to the gear and therefore from the bearings to the shafts. Bearings are structural elements that limit the relative motion of other parts while allowing only some components of the motion to happen with reduced friction. In the case of shaft and gear systems, the bearings will allow the shaft to rotate with little losses of energy while restricting their translation in any orthogonal axis. What we'll do today is find the components of the interaction forces between gears, some of which are transferring the torque and therefore power through the system, and some of which are trying to push the shaft. Of course, the shaft stays in place because of its interaction with the bearings. We'll study bearings in more detail in a few videos from now, link below, but for now we are only interested in being able to calculate the bearing reactions. This is important because with them we will be able to make selections of appropriate bearings but also because these reactions from the bearing to the shaft together with the interaction of the gears is what causes the shaft to be subjected to bending for our shaft fatigue design calculations. Let's quickly take a look again at the categories of gears we will be using. Spur gears have teeth that are parallel to the axis of the gear which is the axis of the shaft that goes through the gear. Helical gears are similar to the spurs, but the teeth are at an angle. The angle between the axis of the gear and the teeth is what's known as the helix angle, psi. If the angle psi, starting at the axis of the gear and rotating towards the orientation of the teeth is a negative angle, meaning you moved clockwise to get to the teeth orientation, the gear is known as a right-hand helical gear. If you move counterclockwise, starting from the axis of the gear towards the line that is parallel to the teeth of the helical gear, the gear is known as a left-hand helical gear. This angle will cause the shaft to be subjected to axial loading as opposed to spur gears. Bevel gears have a conical shape component to them. They are usually used to transmit power between shafts that are not parallel to each other and in most cases that are perpendicular to each other. Just like helical gears, there will be an axial load component that affects the shaft in its axial direction. Finally, the worm gears share many properties of power screws. But just like I mentioned when we studied force and torque relationships of power screws and other fasteners, link below, the main difference is that power screws usually rotate at low speeds and carry high torques, while worm gear configurations rotate at high speeds to transmit high power despite lower torques. And again, just like helical and bevel, worm gears also cause and transmit axial loads. Like I mentioned in a previous video, there are many other ways to categorize gears. However, these four main ones will still suffice to include other shapes that will share many of the base concepts for finding force components. For example, the herringbone gears, which are gears that have both left hand and right hand teeth in them, can be classified under helical gears. I'll mention specific gear shape examples as we go, and I'll point out the main differences and the reasons to use them. For instance, these herringbone gears are used when you want to transfer power more smoothly, just like helical gears, since there is a better contact between teeth while preventing them to generate an axial load. We'll see this in more detail in the next video. Because we later use the variable capital F for the dimension of the gear that we call the face, which will be important when we look at the stresses at the teeth and the Lewis form factor, we use capital W to refer to the forces and all of their components. WT for the tangential force, which is the force that is tangential to the circle of the gear. WR for the radial force, which is the force that is directed towards the center of the gear. And WA for the axial load, which is the component of the force that is parallel to the axis of the gear. Let's look at the forces, force components, and reactions of spur gears on a shaft supported by bearings. And remember that any reaction force will be normal to the surface that is generating the reaction force. For example, a box on a horizontal surface will be subjected to a normal force that is, like the name suggests, normal to that surface. The same box on a slope will be subjected to a normal force that is again, normal to that slanted surface, not just opposite in direction to its weight. If I let any object rest against the wall, the reaction force will be normal to the surface of the wall. And this is just as true for any surface that is not completely flat. If the box is on a dome and not entirely at the top of the dome, the normal force will be perpendicular or again normal to the tangent of the surface at that point. Basic physics. 
Just as I previously explained how due to the involute profile of the teeth, the contact between a tooth from one spur gear to the tooth of another spur gear will create a normal force that will always have the same direction while they're both rotating, following that line of action I explained, link below, the angle between the direction of the force and the tangent at the point of contact is what we call the pressure angle. Depending on the specific profile of the teeth, this angle can take values like 14.5, 20, 22.5, etc. And it's a known value that you can confirm when selecting a gear you're buying. We call the force coming from gear 2 to gear 3 W23, and the reaction force from gear 3 to gear 2 W32. And of course, they have the same value, they're just opposite in direction. If we look at one of the gears, we see that this force has two components, WT and WR, which will be important in a minute. Why is the gear not shifting in the direction of W23? The gear will not move because the gear is located on a shaft that is causing some reaction forces that keep it in place. And since W23 is positioned on the circumference, or now that we know better, the pitch circle, the gear is subjected to a torque as well, equal to W32T, the tangential component, times the pitch radius. If this reaction torque didn't exist, the sum of torque would not be zero. And then we would find an angular acceleration, which would mean that the angular speed is either increasing or decreasing, but never constant. But there isn't an angular acceleration. And under steady state operation, the shafts do rotate at a constant angular speed. The reason the angular acceleration is indeed zero is because what we see is a reaction torque coming from the shaft and possibly originating from another gear on the same shaft somewhere down that shaft. By looking at a free body diagram of the shaft, we see that the section of the shaft between the two gears, three and four, will be subjected to a torque that we can calculate with the force W23T and the pitch radius of gear three. Of course, this torque has to be the same as W5 fourth T times the radius of gear 4. Otherwise, the shaft would be accelerating angularly. We also see that the reaction force that holds the gear in its place, which is a reaction to the force that the gear exerts on the shaft, comes from the bearings supporting the shaft. And of course, taking into account the forces of gear 4 as well. But let's assume there's no gear 4 or 5 for a second, and that the shaft is just delivering the torque at that end. These reaction forces that should add up to W23, the whole vector, not just one of its components, are important because with them we can find and calculate the maximum moment along the shaft, where the torque does exist so that we can calculate the mean and alternating torque and moments for our fatigue design equations. They are also important because the radial forces, and that's any force that is not axial to the axis of the gear, shaft, or bearing, are the forces we'll need to select or design our bearings. So why do we care about the components of W23 if both W23 and the bearing reactions creating the bending of the shaft are on the same plane? When designing our shaft, we kind of don't care if these bending moment forces are at an angle. We only care about the magnitude of the moments to find the alternating normal stresses. So we could just draw shear and bending moment diagrams to find that maximum moment for whatever plane those forces are located on, at whatever angle. The reason we care about the components is because what we know about the system is the total power we're trying to transmit. With both the power and the RPM information, we can find out the torque, and with the pitch radius of the first gear, in this case gear 2, the only thing we really know is the tangential component of the force W23. If we know the pressure angle and the tangential component of W23, we can calculate the entire vector force W23, and with it, the radial component of W23, the one we need for the bending of the shaft and for selecting proper bearings. One last concept to clarify here is the units of horsepower. We already solved some examples using watts. Revolutions per minute have to be transformed to radians per second to be able to obtain torque in newton meters, so that one's easy. On the other hand, horsepower is defined as 550 foot-pounds per second. Starting with RPM, you'd still divide by 60 so that it's revs per second and multiply by 2 pi so that it's radians per second. For every horsepower, you'd have to multiply that power times 550 to get that power in foot-pounds per second, and by dividing that by the angular velocity, you would get what you actually want, which is the torque. 
But remember, and this is very important, you would have torque in pound feet, not pound inches. So if you're going to use the radius of the gear to find the tangential force and with it the total force W23, you'd have to use the radius of the gear in feet, which is unusual, or alternatively find the torque in pound inches by dividing by 12. Let's take a look at an example. What are the reaction forces at the equidistant bearings of shaft B if shaft A is receiving 3 horsepower and rotating at 1800 revs per minute and the pressure angle is 20 degrees for all gears. The first thing to know here about the bearings is that since they are equidistant, each one of them will support half of the force that gear 3 is being subjected to. If gear 2 is rotating counterclockwise, then 3 is rotating clockwise due to the force that 2 generates on 3 and we know that that force happens at an angle. If 3 is rotating clockwise, then 4 is rotating counterclockwise. 4 would be moving counterclockwise because of the force 3 generates on 4, which also occurs at an angle. This means that W43, the force from gear 4 on gear 3, has the same magnitude as W34 and it's opposite in direction. And since we're using components for W23, we'll do the same for W43. Since gear 3 is not shifting towards the upper right of the screen, it means that there's a reaction force from the shaft to the gear in both the x and y axis. And we know that half of each reaction force, x or y, will go to each one of the two bearings. Now, from the last thing I said about power, we know that with the power and the revolutions per minute, we can find the torque that gear 2 transmits to gear 3 through the tangential force W23T. With a power of 1650 foot-pounds per second and a radius of one-sixth of a foot and solving for the tangential force W23T, I would find a value of 52.5 pounds. Since shaft B is not accelerating angularly, it means that the sum of torque of gear 3 is zero. The forces generating a torque are the tangential forces, located at a distance of radius 3. This means that the tangential forces are the same, and of course the radial forces will be the same as well, since the pressure angle is the same for both gears. From a simple right triangle with a pressure angle of 20, I find that the radial forces are equal to the tangential forces times tangent of 20. Using these values, we find the reactions in the x and y direction for gear 3. And by knowing that each bearing, the total reaction would happen at a 45 degree angle, since both components have the same value, and each bearing would carry half of that reaction force. If you'd like to see the solution to similar problems, make sure to check out the links in the video description. In the next video, we will study how to calculate the components of the interaction forces for the other types of gears. Thanks for watching.